Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be talking about um, many of the more recent finds that have been um, keeping me busy here um, at the museum. And um, I've uh, de deliberately um, kept this talk um, to the things probably in the last two or three years since I last talked to the friends. Um, but given the fact that there's quite a few people here um, that possibly aren't familiar with um, these sites, I, I will add a, a little bit of background as well. So I've entitled this talk Squawkzilla and the Giant Penguins and you'll see um, why um, fairly shortly. So the exhibition that's coming up um, at the end of the year is actually going to concentrate on two particular sites that I've been working at now for nearly 20 years. Um, and the first of these is St. Bathans. Now St. Bathans is the younger of the two places I'm going to talk to you today about. And St. Bathans is a site that we believe is around about 20 million years old. Um, we don't have a very tight um, estimate on its age for various reasons. But the, the period that we're absolutely certain it's from is the um, period called the early um, to mid Miocene. And that, that's a period from about 20 million years ago to about 16 million years ago. The site was actually once on the bed of a lake, a very large lake, a lake that is believed may have extended all the way from the Waitaki all the way down to the Nevis Valley. So this is a lake that was probably about five times the size of Lake Taupo today. Um, there's still a bit of debate about whether or not it was actually a single lake or whether or not it could have been a system of lakes, um, much like the, the lakes that we see in the uh, central North Island um, around the Rotorua area, or even potentially a whole basically landscape of lakes uh, similar to, say, for example, the lakes that are found in um, northern Minnesota in, in the USA. And the reason for this um, ambiguity about um, the true nature of the lake is that we only have a few little snippets of the rocks that actually make up this uh, lake bed. Um, but for the last um, 20 years or so, a team which includes um, myself, um, Alan Tennyson from Te Papa, and most especially um, Trevor Worthy, um, who's now at Flinders University um, in the, uh, Australia, in South Australia, um, have been exploring um, this lake. Um, and in particular, a, a couple of very significant deposits around um, the town of St. Bathans. Now, how do we go about this? So I'll just briefly talk about how we actually um, excavated this lake. So this is a, um, a farm paddock just on the side of the Manuherakia River, about two or three kilometres from St. Bathans. But very quickly, um, we exploited that particular area and we got um, into the situation where to actually um, excavate more of the um, bone as we call it, the, the area which has the fossils that we're particularly interested in, we had to um, start um, some larger scale excavations. So here we can see early one morning um, we turn up, this is the pit from our previous excavations, it's actually been filled with water during the, um, the winter, and we excavate through these large boulders which are sitting on top of the soft clays that we're interested in. These large boulders represent um, the, the actual erosion that's occurred over the last um, three or four or five million years. Um, and these are um, the bed, the um, alluvial deposits which actually contain um, quite a lot of gold. And if you're familiar with the history of central Otago, you'll know that um, a large number of holes and, um, have been dug in central Otago to try and excavate for gold and it's actually this particular um, strata that they're interested in. We have absolutely no interest in that strata whatsoever, um, although a few people have um, kept their eye open over the last 20 years but no one has even found one speck of gold in that deposit. We're <coughs> interested in this area here. And by excavating quite large areas, we can get down to the soft blue clay. This, this clay is not your, your typical, what people would imagine fossils are generally in. 
this clay is actually would be perfectly good for actually making pot and other things that in pottery. It's very soft and that uh, makes our job much, much easier. And we excavate down and here's Trevor here and we've basically excavated off all the clay which isn't very rich in bones. It still has a few bones but not very many bones. And then we're down to a layer here which is only about 10 centimetres thick um, but is very rich in bone. And what we think this represents is a, a very short um, period in time when um, the lake bed was, uh, may have dried out because in fact we've got a layer of dead shells right at the base of it. Um, and then a whole bunch of uh, birds and, and their bones potentially have washed down um, the rivers that were flowing into this lake. Um, and <coughs> because of the fact that they've flown into the rivers, they're all disarticulated, what we call disarticulated. That means you don't find a perfect, beautiful skeleton of a bird, you only find individual bones. And because of the fact that this is a lake bed and it's a lake bed from a particularly um, spectacular period in New Zealand's evolution, there's actually a couple of other things going on. And one of those uh, most significant things that's going on is the fact that this lake was full of crocodiles. And because it was full of crocodiles, most of the bones we find have also been chewed. Um, and, and a lot of the bones we find, we only get half the bone. Um, and that makes our job quite difficult. It means that we have to um, decide what animals we've got from the lake from very, very um, fragmentary records and also from um, records where we have to basically take three or four bones that we don't actually um, definitely know are from the same species and make the assumption that they are. Um, and that leaves some of our work a little bit open to interpretation but um, some of these bones are very distinctive and enable um, very certain um, identifications of particular species. So here we've got Trevor just scraping the last of the material off the top of the bone bed. And then the process that we go through um, is rather laborious and not terribly interesting. Although we do occasionally find you know, beautiful complete bones. But the majority of what we're doing is taking this material down to the river and sieving it through fine garden sieves and accumulating a mass of material which is bone and fish bone um, and little pebbles, little white quartz pebbles. Um, and then we're bringing that material back to here, back to Canterbury Museum and back to Flinders University and basically going through every single one of those little stones and little bones um, under a microscope identifying those which are bird, those that are fish, those that are reptiles, those that are um, in particular, and this is the most exciting thing, mammals, um, and, um, and then taking that material away, um, comparing it to um, the collections that we have here at Canterbury Museum, um, which contain um, many of the skeletons of living birds and other animals, um, and coming to a conclusion about what sort of animals we actually had in this lake. And that's the process of paleontology. It isn't, most paleontology isn't what you see on the Discovery Channel with um, some guy with a bone which is 10, ten times um, his length, um, which he's um, laboriously um, cutting out of a rock using a jackhammer and then, um, and then a little um, brush. It's actually much more about um, taking large amounts of sediment and processing them um, firstly in the field and then bringing them back to a lab and going through it laboriously under a microscope. So I'm, I'm sorry to disillusion you about that. So here is us, the first illustration there you saw before we'd taken away the material and here is Trevor and my wife Vanessa. I'm standing in the hole after we've taken all that material away. And this was an excavation that we did in 2018. Um, in 2019 we had a much smaller team. Um, we've, what we're each year planning to do is, is what Trevor um, is indicating there, which is keep on heading back into the hill. Each year taking off about 10 square metres of material and 
um, excavating away um, right up to the, the um, edge here where the erosion that's occurred in the last um, several million years has actually taken away the material. Okay, and so what sort of things have we, have we found recently? Well, as I mentioned in the, in the past, we found crocodiles, we found giant turtles, we found about 40 different types of birds, we found a few species of bats, we found a bunch of different mollusks, we found frogs, um, even some quite gigantic frogs related to the living frogs that are here in New Zealand today. And we've found just a few enigmatic um, pieces of a mammal that we're absolutely certain as a type of terrestrial mammal. And that, that's what's been paying for a lot of this um, work that we've been doing over the years. Uh, because in about 2008, we actually found the first evidence of a terrestrial mammal from um, New Zealand. Um, and, you know, the um, original paradigm had been that New Zealand had always been free of mammals. Um, and that is why our birds became fat and lazy and, and uh, basically um, weren't worried about um, predation from mammals. Um, but we've now got firm evidence that there actually were mammals here, but they weren't very big. That's, that's an interesting thing in itself. But um, the, um, that mammal that we've got this enigmatic evidence of has been dubbed the waddling mouse. Um, because of some of the uh, some of its uh, because of its size and, and some of its structures, um, but apart from that, um, we have enough really to go on to actually work out what this animal is related to. But what we did discover amongst the mammalian material that we've got, um, and it was described only last year, is this fellow here, which was named Vulcanops, and that is a bit of a play on the fact that the Vulcan pub is just up the road, and also the fact that um, Vulcan um, itself was actually the god of the underworld, and that this fellow here um, was very strange in a number of ways. For example, um, it was very large for a bat. It was about four or five times the size of um, most of the members of the typical bat group, not the fruit bats, but the typical insectivorous bats. Um, and it was also um, very, very terrestrial. And in fact, we can't say for sure, but there's a possibility that it was actually flightless. And this is secondarily flightless. It had become flightless many um, millions of years after bats had actually learned to fly. Um, so the, the bat group as a whole had evolved um, the ability to fly in the air scene. And um, by the time which was about uh, 40, 50, uh, 40 or 50 million years ago. Um, and by the time that um, uh, we're excavating here in St. Bathans, 20 million years ago, this is potentially a bat that had become flightless. So Vulcanops was really quite a, a surprising discovery. Another uh, interesting thing is that the bulk of the birds that we're actually finding at um, St. Bathans are ducks. Um, and they're ducks that are reasonably closely related to the little scorp that you see um, in the Avon River today. They're diving ducks. They're not related to the types of duck that most people hunt, for example, the mallard duck. They're a, a, a more primitive group of ducks. And this is an artist's impression of, of what we think the sides of the lake might have looked like. Lots of ducks, maybe some geese these reeds, quite similar to the rapo that you see today. But the second most common thing after ducks are these tiny wee little rails. Rails are the group of birds that include the pukeko and the weka. Um, and these little rails that we find here are, are really quite abundant and also flightless. So we've had a student working at um, Flinders University on these rails and we've got a, a new PhD student now working on them to look at their relationships. But these little rails aren't related to the weka that we have today. Um, they're a more primitive group of, of rails. And this is one that my wife Vanessa described um, two years ago now. So we've had a bunch of pigeons from the St. Bathan site, and many of these are, are not too distantly related to the pigeons that we have in New Zealand today, the, the fruit pigeon, the giant cuckoo or kereru. And so we, we, we didn't think there were any huge surprises amongst the, the pigeons, but 
Um, Vanessa managed to find just a few bones of something that was really was quite surprising and this was a bird that is most closely related to the dodo and also to this living bird, the Nicobar pigeon. And this is a very primitive group of pigeons, um, <clears throat> unrelated to the, to the pigeons that you see in the square today, um, and really um, quite uh, primitive in, in their, their habits. This pigeon may have been terrestrial as well. And Vanessa's also been looking at the shorebirds. We've had a, a bunch of shorebirds um, from the site. And one of the most interesting shorebirds we found was a bit of a missing link. So this bird here is known as the plains wanderer. It's a very rare shorebird that never goes to the shore and is only found today in central New South Wales, the very north of central Victoria and the very south of central Queensland. And that there's possibly only a few thousand of these uh, little fellas in existence. They're tiny, they're only about this big. Um, they're entirely nocturnal. Um, so this is the plains wanderer. This fellow here is known as a seed snipe. And a seed snipe are a group of four or five species that are only found in the Andes today. Um, and these are, you can see some superficial similarities um, between these, these two birds. And, the fossils that we've found at St. Bathans are actually sort of intermediate between these two types of bird. So this is a, a very interesting Gondwanan link. The, the idea being that um, this fellow is only found in central Australia, this fellow is only found in the Andes, um, and potentially their ancestor um, was actually either um, on all three continents, or um, which, in, which are South America, Australia, and Zealandia, or even more interestingly, potentially was found on four continents, Antarctica, Zealandia, um, New Zealand, uh, Zealandia, South America, and Australia. And um, w the relatives of, of the proto-plains wanderer seized snipe um, were spread out. Um, the, obviously, those that were on Antarctica became extinct. Um, the um, one became the plains wanderer, um, another group became the seed snipe, um, and the New Zealand ones unfortunately became extinct. Um, so that's an interesting Gondwanan link we've found for, through our fossils. And then there's another really amazing one that Vanessa found as well. So this bird here is one of the most unpleasant birds you'll ever come across. Um, this is known as a sheathbill, and it specialises in the eating the faeces of penguins and Antarctica. There's two different types of them and that's basically all they do. So the sheathbill, only found in Antarctica now. The Magellanic plover, um, only found in Patagonia. And the fossil we've found is intermediate between these two. So once again, exactly the same story. An Antarctic link, a South American link, a New Zealand link. Is this a Gondwanan connection? We think so. So that's pretty, th these are really fascinating um, what we call biogeographic links that, that give us an insight into the way the entire fauna of New Zealand evolved. But the really um, crucial and somewhat unknown um, thing here is the fact that a lot of these clues um, to how the fauna and flora of New Zealand evolved are extinct. Um, and a, a growing consensus, especially amongst people that look at the vertebrates in New Zealand, is very few of the vertebrate animals that we see today are actually a Gondwanan in origin. Um, once, upon, once upon a time, and I'm not talking about that far long ago, maybe in 1960s, 1970s, it was thought that all of these different groups were actually Gondwanan. Um, but in fact, the, the um, use of DNA to actually um, look at the uh, age of different lineages is giving us an insight into the, um, to the age of these lineages. And many of these um, groups, um, and for example, um, the Takahe and Pukeko is a good example. Um, the Takahe was once thought to be an ancient New Zealand relative. We now think that it's actually uh, just a fat, lazy pukeko that probably turned up from Australia about two or three million years ago. Um, and so <coughs> that, that scenario is happening over and over again. We're finding 
lots and lots of our iconic birds are, are still iconic and still important, but only a very few lineages are ancient. And the lineages that we're uh, most, we're most um, convinced are ancient are things like the little New Zealand wrens, the riflemen, and um, the rock wren, and the extinct bush wren, um, and the kākāpō, kia, um, and, and kāka. Um, those two lineages, we're very confident, could well have been had their relatives on Gondwana when um, it um, first broke up about 50 or 60 million years ago. And I mentioned the kaka and the kakapo, and we've actually already described a couple of different parrots that are most closely related to kakapo from St. Bathans. But this is one that you, you might actually be familiar with. For many years, since 2008 in fact, we've had these bones in the collection from St. Bathans. Now, they're big. This bone here is a kākāpō, which is a big animal, um, but this is much, much bigger. And we definitely have the remains of several eagles from this site, but we haven't had enough bone material to actually decide what they're actually related to. And we put these bones into a pile that we labelled eagle question mark. This year, we've just had a PhD student start who's looking at describing the eagles because we now have enough material to do that. But she very quickly realised that these were not eagle bones. They don't have many of the distinguishing features of eagles. Um, and in fact, um, that's when um, one of the most surprising discoveries we've ever made um, at St. Bathans actually um, came about. We actually realised quite quickly that these are actually parrots. But these are big parrots. These are much bigger parrots than any parrot that lives today and any parrot that's ever been described in the past from, from anywhere. Um, and so to, to give you that idea, this is a kākāpō's, um, the same bone of a kākāpō. And as I mentioned, um, crocodiles are always eating away these bones. So the bottom of this bone and the top of this bone are actually missing, probably from about there up and from there down. But there's still enough features for us to be very confident this is a parrot, and a parrot that we think is moderately closely related to kākāpō. Um, but when you scale up this bone to a, um, to a living bird, um, you, get, you come to the conclusion that this was a big parrot. It was nearly a metre tall. Um, <clears throat> and when we were writing this up, um, one of our co-authors, a, a famous paleontologist from Australia, um, Dr. Mike Archer, who's quite famous for coming up with um, catchy titles um, for papers, um, and had coined for some giant moa-like birds from Australia, he'd coined the term demon duck of doom um, <laughs> because of the fact that they were a duck which was about the same size as um, a, a, a small moa. Um, and for this, he coined the name Squawkzilla. <laughs> so this is what we, uh, an artist's impression of what Squawkzilla might have looked like, a kaka slash kakapo relative, but we're talking one, one metre tall, with, you know, huge, almost talon-like feet. We put this out into the media about three or four months ago, and instantly um, we discovered that the only time something is actually famous is when there are memes on the internet, on Facebook and on other um, social media sites. And we spawned thousands of these memes. And I thought you might be interested in seeing some of these. So this is Squawkzilla, King of the Parrots. Um, a little cartoon actually from the BBC website. <laughs> <coughs> no, you get in the cage. An emotional support animal. So it, it really is quite surprising how the uh, parrots, and as you'll see in a minute, um, penguins, actually are really much more interesting to the general public than other groups of animals. Um, like, for example, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but w w we put a much more interesting animal out in the media, but it didn't receive as much media attention as Squawkzilla and the giant penguins did. And this was particularly surprising to us. After we put this out, and it had been all around the world, and literally hundreds of newspapers worldwide, we got a phone call from the Guinness Book of World Records, 
who wanted to put it into their new upcoming volume. So now, for the first time ever, we've actually got the attention of the Guinness Book of Records. And eventually I'll get a nice little certificate for my wall saying that a giant parrot has actually um, the world's largest parrot um, and here's your certificate. <laughs> and I remember when I was a kid reading the Guinness Book of Records and actually thinking this was actually really significant. So maybe it is. Of course, all this work doesn't come just from us sitting here in New Zealand and scratching around in holes. There's quite a lot of comparative work that needs to be done. So this is just an example of where this sort of research can actually take you. This is actually the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. And this is probably one of the best views I've ever had out of a lab window. This is actually the Capitol building here. That's the Department of Justice out of interest. That's where lots of people are very busy right now. So, but this is really a very remarkable uh, view and you can see here is myself, this is a photo taken by my wife Vanessa, and we're using the collections of the Smithsonian Institute, some of the best comparative collections of animals in the world, um, um, to actually compare our bones from these different sites, from St. Bathans for example, and from the uh, white program I'm talking about in a second. Um, we're comparing those to the bones of both fossil animals and living animals from throughout the world. Because <clears throat> we can't make the assumption that these things that we're finding in St. Bathans and in the North White Pro are actually related directly to things that are in New Zealand today. Um, and in many, many cases we're finding that's the case, that there are species that we're finding in St. Bathans and in North White Pro that have no relationship to living birds um, and other animals in New Zealand today. Okay, giant penguins. So for many years it's been known that New Zealand has a very remarkable fossil record of giant penguins. There, there were several described um, in the 19th century, especially from the limestones around Omaru. But about uh, 15 years ago, uh, we started looking a bit further, further afield because we knew that there were some enigmatic fossils um, found elsewhere. And the white pro was where this first came to a head, but I'll just mention this fella first because we now believe this is the, the largest penguin that's ever been found. This is an animal that's called Kumi Waimanu, and Kumi Waimanu um, is undoubtedly the largest penguin um, that has been described to date. The South Americans are always saying they're finding bigger ones, but um, we're very confident that this is much larger. Um, and this is to give you an estimate of, of the size of this animal, 1.7 metres long. Um, and this comes from Hampton, um, Hampton Beach, just north of Wai um, Moiraki um, in North Otago. And we've only got a very um, fragmentary fossil so far. Um, the humerus of this animal is not much shorter than the humerus of, an, of a human being. And, um, and that probably gives you the idea that its actual flipper was about the same size as human beings as well. There have been a lot of different um, illustrations of this animal. I think this one's quite nice, giving you the impression that this would have been quite a scary animal to come across if you were scubaing. But uh, rest assured, this was 60 million years ago that this animal existed. Um, and New Zealand was a very different place, and I'll talk about that in a second. So here we have how much bigger it is than living penguins today. So a emperor penguin standing pretty much on its tippy toes would be 1.1 metres tall, and Kumi Waiwano we think is about 1.65 metres tall. So really a, a truly remarkably huge animal. And it also had some other rather different features, um, and some of these features we think are actually because of the fact that it was, it was very primitive, actually right at the very beginning of penguin evolution. It had a very long bill, a bill much more like a heron's than a penguin that you'd see today. And it also, its wing wasn't very straight like the penguins that you see today. It actually had a bit of a bend in it. And this bend we're suggesting is because of the fact that it was only a few million years, um, that this bird had only evolved for a few million years from a flighted ancestor. It actually has a morphology which is very similar to a bird called the great auk which became extinct at the um, beginning of the 20th century um, and is very closely related to puffins. Um, so, 
and we actually know from using genetic evidence that there was only a few million years of separation between the puffins and other orcs and the great orc. Um, so we're suggesting that um, the ancestor of Nakumi Manu may have actually only evolved a few million years um, from a flighted ancestor. And because of the fact that this is a very ancient group, this animal is actually very interesting for another point of view. And that the, the, the point is that this animal's fossils are only found about five million years after that catastrophic event um, that caused the extinction of dinosaurs and about um, a third of all other um, animal and plant groups. And this event was clearly catastrophic. It wiped out the dinosaurs, it wiped out the marine reptiles. Um, and basically the earth got a bit of a clean slate um, and especially the oceans got a clean slate because these giant marine reptiles, these predatory animals that probably would have eaten um, sharks and fish and, and um, any sort of other um, bird that came along were gone and there was a, there's a potential that the birds um, which were um, a, the last lineage of dinosaurs had this opportunity to become um, just go crazy and their evolution did go crazy. We now know from DNA evidence that in fact the bulk of bird evolution actually happened in the 10 million years following the extinction of dinosaurs. Almost all living groups of birds that you know today came into existence in the, that 10 million year period after the dinosaurs became extinct. And, and there were all sorts of wacky experiments going on in evolution and this is probably one of the most wacky. A giant penguin um, roaming the seas um, of New Zealand 60 million years ago. So as I'm saying, the 60 million years ago New Zealand was a very different place. For a start we were about 55 degrees south. So um, here in Christchurch was 55 degrees south. But the seas were much, much warmer. The seas were ab approximately um, 20 to 25 degrees sea surface temperature. So that's basically the sea surface temperature that you'd see in Cairns or even further north in Cooktown in Australia. And we had corals. We had corals such as this, Wipraconus. Uh, once was thought to be a stalk barnacle but now known to be a coral and this is found in amongst these uh, fossil penguins that in the white pro green sand which is the area that I'm going to talk to uh, Moni about now. So the white pro green sand is a, a deep sea green sand that occurs when you know well off offshore in an area where the, you know, most animals don't occur you get a particular type of deposition which is actually quite sediment free and you get a, a particular type of mineral known as glauconite forming which is why it's green, glauconite's green. And over the last 20 or 25 years now a bunch of amateurs or two in particular have been looking up in this white pro green sand that was originally said to be fossil, um, non -fo what they call non-fossiliferous, it didn't have fossils. People have been walking past the white green sand to go and look at um, giant marine reptiles for generations. In fact, right since the 1860s when Haast and um, McKay uh, first went up to the um, inner white river, the upper white river. They'd walk past this green sand and said, it isn't fossiliferous, don't worry about it. But if, and this is the other, there have been two amateurs that have, have been dedicated to looking at the site and have really totally changed our opinion, of not just about um, the fossiliferous nature of the Wiper green sands, but also about the, basically about the evolution of birds in New Zealand and, and worldwide. So as I say, this is where the Wiper green sand is now. This is what, where we think potentially the coastline was or even, um, even potentially even further um, offshore, you know, even potentially the land was in Hokitika um, and this was all sea. And on the inner shelf we've got the deposition of just a few fossils on this green sand. And we've got these totally bizarre sharks. That this, is the, this is the reason that Al actually first went up there. He likes collecting shark's teeth and there's some totally bizarre sharks that actually occur in this area. And these are just the living relatives of some of these shark species that you actually find in this green sand. 
this is probably the weirdest. This is called the frilled shark. Um, and um, where's the other one? This one here, the goblin shark here. Um, both these animals are, are um, deep, very deep sea animals. Um, and in fact, the goblin shark's only ever been um, seen about 50 times alive. But um, the relatives of all these different um, sharks are known to occur in this area because of the teeth, of their teeth. We've got these, um, and, and this is, collectors quite like this. Amateur collectors really like to collect these teeth because they're really quite um, striking. And of course, you probably, many of you have seen the uh, Megalodon um, shark's teeth, which there's even a movie about this giant um, shark. Um, that doesn't occur this far back, but, um, but uh, th these are very collectible. And we know that there's different types of fish from this site, as you'd imagine, in the sea. We know that there's very large turtles, turtles, sea turtles, which are two to three metres long, about the same size as the very large turtles that you, you find today, the leatherback turtle, sorry. So we've got a few um, turtle remains. And we've got giant penguins again. <laughs> so this is the one that made the news a few months ago. This is called Crossvalia. Uh, we've named it Crossvalia. And this is very interesting because, in fact, the nearest relative of this animal, Crossvalia, is actually from the Antarctic Peninsula and is actually from an island called Seymour Island, which has a valley on it called the Cross Valley. So this is, isn't just um, quite closely related to Antarctic penguins, it's very closely related to Antarctic penguins of the same age. That's the critical thing. And once again, it doesn't really look like a modern penguin. It's got a very long bill, it's got bent flippers, and it's got a gait which is much more like a shag or an, or a, an animal that touches that. This is the animal that Al discovered, which is actually named after him, Waimanu Manaringai. And this is just showing that we, we, once again, we don't have a complete skeleton of any of these penguins. Crossvalia and is only known from its legs. Um, Waimanu Manaringai is just known from um, scattered bones. This is another um, one of these giant penguins, quite a skinny little fella, bent wings, huge bill, and a gait which is somewhat different to modern penguins. This is this, uh, the one that, the, the penguin that uh, you saw um, Al holding in his hands, a tiny penguin. So we do have giant penguins, but we also have tiny penguins. Um, and by tiny, I'm saying, the, either the size of the little blue penguin alive today or even smaller. So it's not just that we have these giant penguins, there's a whole different suite of types of penguin in this site. This is an animal that was known for, for more than 60 years now from the Matanau Beach, which is a, a bizarre group of birds, from a bizarre group of birds called the false toothed paddockins or the bony toothed birds. And these are huge birds. These are the largest living birds, some of these, um, with a wingspan of up to six metres. So nearly three times the size of this fellow up here. Um, and wingspan. And these giant bills, which are totally bizarre for the fact that they've got teeth. There's some argument about whether these teeth are actually analogous to the teeth that we have, or whether they're, not, or whether they're just protrusions from the bill. But until... Just two years ago, this was all that we knew about bony toothed birds from New Zealand. Um, and then, um, just last year, we found this, the fossil that this is a, an artist reconstruction of. This bird was only about the size of a black-backed gull today. So we, we, we were calling it the, um, the oldest, smallest, and most primitive of the bony toothed birds. And it actually has features which are different from other bony toothed birds, like, for example, a nostril, which is much, much more like a, um, a petrel. Um, and you can see there, are, this is artist reconstruction of it living in, in the sea alongside the, um, these giant penguins. These um, sediments are actually problematic because of the fact that the chemicals, the mineralization of the green sand is really annoying and it, it's got too much iron in it and it's got too much sulfur and this leads to the fact that it's very difficult to actually extract the bones. They're actually basically concreted in, in the what fool's gold, pyrite. So what we've got to do is actually use CT scanning and this is an animation showing how using CT scanning and the techniques that modern medicine uses what they call segment a fossil, 
you can actually find out exactly what each bone looks like and actually then 3D print it and describe an animal without actually removing the bones from the rock. And this is a really fundamental change in us or being able to describe fossils. And this is basically, this fossil was only really able to be described and fully understood uh, its relationships because of the fact that we've got that CT scanning technology today. So it's not just bony toothed birds, it's not just giant penguins and even tiny penguins. We've also got uh, relatives of other things, for example, um, tropic birds. And these are now exclusively found in the tropics, as their name suggests, but they were once um, in 60 million year old New Zealand sediments. And this is another bizarre bird that uh, we named Australis lovey, named after um, Lee Love, its discoverer. Um, and we don't really know what this is related to. Um, so there's a lot more to be discovered about the, the animals of North Canterbury.